Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, our next speaker is Joseph Cox, and it's inside the FBI's secret encryption phone company, Anam. Give him a nice, warm DEF CON welcome. Thank you, Thank you so much. All right. Uh, I'll speed up the first little bit because of the slight delay. I'll start with a story. This guy, Domenico Gatan Soretti, he's from South Australia. He's a drug trafficker. Started with methamphetamine before moving into lots and lots of cocaine. He also sold specialized encrypted phones from a company called Phantom Secure. These were ordinary BlackBerry devices that had the microphone removed, the camera, the GPS taken out, and then they added PGP email encryption to those phones, which I'm sure you're all familiar with. And this allowed him and other criminals to talk um, outside of the eyes of law enforcement, basically. But the FBI shuts down Phantom Secure in 2018, fast, uh, go forward a few years, and Katan is working on this other drug deal. He says, on a different encrypted phone, a mate of mine has imported a welder uh, with his mate's company. UPS has rang up and said they need a broker to sign the paperwork off the customs. Is that something you can do? In other words, he's asking somebody, hey, we have these items at customs. We need somebody on the inside to sign them in. And this is very common when it comes to drug trafficking. There's a little bit of confusion about whether they're importing weapons, or cocaine, or whatever it is. And he jokes across this app, you kill me, pieces, bricks, keys, keys, rack, roba, coca, okay, let's make millions. He's the real fucking deal. And that's actually what the welder looks like. You take the panel off, there's a safe inside there, and then there's something inside that safe. But there's something wrong. Somebody goes to pick up this welding machine, and the officials at the port or the warehouse, they keep saying, uh, Hmm, they're not here for some reason, like you must, there must be a mistake. Until eventually, a few days later when he returns, they tell them, oh, your welding machine has been seized by the Australian border force. Um, that's obviously not ideal for Captain Zerati. And then another message that somebody sends across an encrypted phone, pigs grabbed him. I don't really need to translate that. It means the police got him, obviously. And then this is what's inside the safes, inside the welding machine a shitload of cocaine. Of course, what Katan Zerati did not realize was that the phone he was using, made by a company called Anom, was secretly run by the FBI, and thousands of miles away, FBI Special Agent Marshall Muse was reading his messages, as well as other agents as well. Uh, so who am I and why the hell should you listen to what I'm saying about Anom? I'm the author of Dark Wire, which I'm going to go into more detail shortly. I'm a co-founder of 404 Media. We used to work at Motherboard, the technology section of Vice, before we quit corporate media, media to make our own four-person team investigative tech outlet. Thank you. So for Dark Wire, I've spoken to the people who coded the phones, the people who sell them to drug traffickers, the drug traffickers themselves, the FBI agents who manage this operation, uh, other law enforcement officials from Europol, from the Netherlands, from Sweden, from Australia. And as you're going to see for the first time, which I haven't published before, I got a lot of documents about a norm. That photo, the top one, that's me trying to slyly take a photo outside the FBI San Diego field office when there was a camera looking down at me, just making eye contact with it. And then that badge is from when I snuck into a law enforcement only conference in Vancouver. I just signed up my real name and they didn't know who I was, so they still let me in. Uh, briefly, what I'm going to talk about. The phone, so that's the software, the hardware, the network itself, and for the first time, the FBI front-end uh, interface. Then the structure of a norm, sort of actually how this pyramid scheme work, uh, worked and how all the people interacted, and of course the FBI's role at the top. Then there's going to be a little bit more of a story, sort of like the one I opened with, but about a guy called Microsoft, not related to the tech company. He just calls himself Microsoft. He had a friend in prison called Linux as well. Um, and these black boxes, which you're going to see, and why a norm started to grow out of control. And then, just briefly, 
what this means for the going dark debate. I'm a journalist, I'm not an activist, I'm not a law enforcement official. I can't really decide where this debate goes, nor should I. That's sort of up to everybody else in the room, right? I just want to tell you what happens when the FBI did actually get a backdoor. So let's talk about the phone. Here is my Anom device. I bought it on the secondary market uh, off Gumtree or eBay or something, because when the FBI revealed they were running it, a lot of criminals tried to sell the phone stupidly. Uh, this was a Google Pixel 4a. It also came on Pixel 2s, Pixel 3as, Samsung Galaxies, and some Chinese phones as well. And these were the black boxes I hinted at that I'm going to talk about a bit later. They were just Intel Nook's next unit of computing. And it's just this tiny little computer, right? Kind of like a Mac Mini in a, in a way, I guess. And you plug a phone into this, and it would load the Anom messaging app itself, and then also the custom operating system called Arcane OS, based on Graphene OS with some little tweaks that we'll get into. But that's actually sort of the production line of these phones. Um, now, let's say you're a drug trafficker, and you've bought the Anom device, and you open it up. What does it look like? And actually, sort of what are some of the interesting gadgets? You can see that one with the red box. The numbers aren't in order. They've all been scrambled up. And this is so that when you're entering the pin code, um, you know, somebody can't look over your shoulder and like guess the pattern because you have to type it in every single different time. Uh, there's a wipe code on the middle as well. And then the pin scrambling I just mentioned. There's a decoy pin. So if you type in one pin rather than the other, it will reveal sort of a second half of the operating system that has a Netflix app in there, a Tinder app, I think there's even a Candy Crush as well, and none of those apps work. The point is that you're crossing a border or you're being arrested by the cops, you quickly type in the second pin, give them the phone, oh look, there's nothing on there, this guy was just playing Candy Crush, he's not an international drug trafficker. Um, then you have the Anom app itself, which was hidden behind a calculator. You would type in something like two times two, press equals, the calculator fades away, and the Anom app reveals itself. Drug traffickers love their gadgets and their gizmos. They love all of these like bells and whistles, even though I think most people in this room will probably agree a lot of this is security theater. You know, these aren't real security precautions. But if you're a drug trafficker and you see this, you're like, damn, OK, I will give you $1,000 for a six-month subscription, or even $2,000 sometimes. These phones are expensive. So this is what the user profiles inside a NOM actually look like. Uh, you make an account uh, through a reseller. You can then choose your profile photo. You've got Edward Snowden there, uh, El Chapo's son, Thanos, Che Guevara. Uh, I mean, you can see them all. And they, beyond the profile photos, what I heard from the FBI was that dozens upon dozens of criminals use the username James Bond, just because that's how they see themselves. That's the interface, uh, the actual chat app itself. This is long away from just the PGP encrypted emails I mentioned. They were sluggish, they were slow. Criminals now have, you know, WhatsApp, iMessage, but for criminals. It's slick, it's modern, it works. The MDM. So a non worked with mobile device management, started with Mobile Iron before moving to FieldX. Uh, and this is important not just for the FBI itself and the monitoring, but the managing of the Anom company. Because it, uh, it gave the capability to have what they called Arcane Manager. I mentioned that Arcane OS is the operating system. Anybody in a management position in Anom, which was the informant called AFGU, I'll explain later, and the FBI as well, they could look at this panel and see, oh, look, there are more than 9,000 Anom devices online. They could flick through and then see the IMSIs or the IMEIs, uh, all of this other sort of information. This is not the surveillance part of Anom. This is more the tech company part. And I know that might be a little bit confusing. I think it'll be clearer uh, the more we go on. And then just more, you know, your normal analytics, all, all of that sort of thing. So. As for the network infrastructure of how this backdoor and surveillance apparatus actually worked, you start with the XMPP server. At the end of the day, 
Anon is just jabber, basically. It's, you know, people talking over XMPP with some encryption added. You then have a proxy server, which crucially hides the third-party country server, which is this country that collected all of the messages for the FBI, then a transfer server, then ingestion, then the FBI's front end. The DOJ is never going to admit this, is never going to acknowledge it, but I found that the third country is Lithuania. That was the country that got the court order to do this worldwide interception. Obviously, the front end is in the US, and I'm pretty sure the proxy server, or one of them, is in the UK, based on leaks I got from inside Anon. So, not only is it worldwide surveillance capability, the infrastructure of this is spread globally as well, despite it all coming back to the FBI in San Diego. You have the classic Alice and Bob sort of um, chat example, right? And this is introducing how the backdoor actually worked. You have Alice sending their message that goes through AWS, goes to the Jabba uh, server, then back through to Bob. The S3 bucket at the bottom, I think that was for attachments, for videos, for photos, that sort of thing. And then on the right, you have the most important part, bot. This is the back door into Anon. As it says, all sent messages carbon copied to bot. So basically what the FBI did was that even if two people were just DMing, the FBI added this sort of ghost contact and turned every DM into a group chat. The FBI was silently in every single DM being sent across Anon. These are just some code examples from the APK that I got leaked as well. Uh, you know, echo and support, they're not really important. Backup was a, a backup feature you could use to archive your messages on Anom. I don't think many people used it. But the bit I've highlighted, bot at, and then the domain used by Anom. And then as you see here, bot got recreated at the server. This is the most important part of the entire operation. So I mentioned Lithuania and they're collecting all of these messages and then shipping them over to the FBI. I, I'm not gonna get too into the legal stuff, but the reason the FBI did that was because they didn't think they could do it legally. They couldn't do it in the United States. They had to get a third country to circumvent the legal protections, uh, basically. So every Monday and Wednesday, Lithuania would provide anom messages to the FBI. You have the new database dump on, on the far edge. You then obviously take out the messages you already have. That is, here's your new data. You then encrypt it to a key that just the FBI has. You send it over to the FBI and they're very, very happy because all of these chats just arrived with no strings attached. There's no warrant, at least for the FBI. There's no sort of court order beyond an MLAT, a mutual, mutual legal assistance treaty, which means, can we have that data, please? Yes, here you go. Now for the interface. What, if you're sat in San Diego, in these rooms and rows and rows of computers, which I've walked through, this is the interface the FBI actually used to wiretap the world and then look through those messages. Holler, iBot, iBot referring to that back door I mentioned. Holler is, I don't know, sarcastically saying hello, we're monitoring all your chats or something, I guess. Um, but you log in and you need access via a law enforcement portal. This is how you get sorts of forensic tools, all that sort of thing, and the FBI would assign access to people who needed it, either in San Diego or later, that would be other agencies uh, as well. Let's say you log in, you zero in on a user, you can then see all of their chats at the bottom, you can see various other information about their device, the members of the conversation, and then markings sort of in the middle of the screen, the FBI could select pertinent, non-pertinent, uh, non-pertinent or, or, or cannabis, because some agencies were reading all these messages and like, well, we don't care about weeds. Like, we just want to read messages about coke or heroin or whatever. Um, then you can pivot slightly and you can have these generated translations of all the messages coming in. So as the FBI expanded the norm around the world, Obviously, tons of those messages were not in English. In this case, they were in uh, Bernese German. And the FBI used in-house translators to rapidly translate these messages as much as they could, or they also turned to automated systems from AWS. But then you, you look on the right-hand side, sort of at the top, it provides a summary, and it says online two, ghost communicate, uh, comments on Tommy's Spanish skills, and it says they did this, they did that. And the idea is that 
these summaries would surface what was interesting or important to the FBI analyst, so they didn't have to literally read every single message. They can go, oh, okay, they're talking about cocaine. I should probably, um, I should probably read this. And as I said, it keeps going and it keeps expanding. And this is just to give an idea of the sort of languages that were being spoken across the norm. You have Swedish, Serbian, Chinese, Croatian, Bernese German again, uh, Albanian, Italian. And this just shows that the FBI is not policing inside the US borders here. It is really doing a worldwide surveillance uh, operation. Of course, it's not just text messages being sent across the platform. Tons of photos as well. Um, drug traffickers love to send photos of their product, or they say, hey, I'm parked here, and they also send selfies, as you can see in the bottom left-hand corner. Um, what Anom also had, it would introduce features that were attractive to the drug traffickers, but they always had a secondary feature for the FBI. So one example of the images would be we can, the users could redact any part of the image they wanted. You know, I can blur out somebody's face. I could blur out maybe some bank details or something. The FBI got a raw copy of all of those as well. S similar with the voice memos. So later on, it could, there was like a walkie-talkie sort of thing, or like when you send like a voice note on Signal, that sort of thing. Uh, and there was a modulation feature where you could select, please make my voice very high-pitched or very low-pitched, with the idea being, well, if the cops get it, they're not going to tell who it is because I sound like this or whatever. The FBI could reverse engineer it and get a copy of the original audio as well. Most crucially of all, I think, I mentioned Arcane OS, which beyond the anon messaging app with the back door, the entire OS itself was backdoored. So while Anom allegedly turned off all GPS functionality in the devices, and that's what the users were told, you went into the settings and it's like, oh, I can't even select GPS, it must have gone. Uh, the FBI was collecting the GPS location attached to most messages. So whenever somebody sent a message, it could pinpoint their exact location uh, as well. Um, and I think everybody would understand that it's not always necessarily the content that's important, there's also the metadata, right? So by mapping out all of these messages, the FBI was able to figure out, of course, who is speaking to who and then in what context. So in the middle, red is just the device that you, the analyst may be looking at, blue are other people that they're talking to, and then green is a group chat. Uh, and I mean, it got to the point where you'd have members of the Comachero bikers gang, and they were having group chats about, we need to go kill this guy, we need to go beat this guy up. And the FBI could see all of the members of that group chat who were presumably involved or at least aware of, of this criminal uh, conspiracy. So that's sort of how the phone works, how the backdoor works. What about the actual company? Because the FBI was secretly managing this company, but it was almost an autonomous entity in its own right. It had to go out and it had to operate like a tech company, it had to look like a tech company, so the criminals didn't get suspicious. So at the top, you have somebody called AFGU, A-F-G-O-O. He is the informant who gave an arm to the FBI. Um, after the FBI shut down Phantom Secure in 2018, it was clear that the gold rush of selling phones to organized criminals may be coming to an end. Like, the FBI is finally paying attention, we can't do this anymore. So, AFGU approaches the FBI and says, I'm making my own company and I've been working on it. It's called a NOM. If I give this to you, could you give me a lower sentence for any sort of charges I may or may not face in the future? And he also got around 120K as well. Below AFGU are the big distributors. I would call these like the main sellers of a NOM. These guys are ordinary criminals. They don't know about the back door. They are drug traffickers, primarily. The main one, Hakan Ayik. Uh, there, these are some photos from his wedding that I found online, and obviously blurred out his wife and child. But he is a top-tier drug trafficker, most wanted man from Australia. He heads the Aussie cartel, a billion-dollar cartel which controls, I think, a third of the drugs going into Australia, um, lives in Turkey. And he was in this higher echelon of deciding where the phones go. And that's a spreadsheet I got leaked from inside a NOM. And maybe it's a little dark, but you can see at the top, just in the drug traffickers spreadsheet, it says last, last edit was done by uh, Hakan. 
and you can see there, well, here's the, here's the brand of the phone, like the Pixel 4a or whatever, the person it's being sent to, uh, and the, the quantity and that sort of thing. So he's control, controlling the supply chain uh, of these devices. Below those distributors, you have the resellers. They're sometimes called the agents. These are the guys who are on the ground. They're driving their Lambos to go drop off one of these phones. They are interfacing directly with the drug trafficking end users. Um, and that's a desk of one reseller who's flashing some phones. In the middle, you have much the same thing using those Intel boxes I showed earlier. Uh, and then that last photo isn't actually from a NOM. That's from another reseller of a different company I got. But you know, luxury hotels around a swimming pool with escorts, that sort of thing, just to give you an idea of the sort of people who are selling these devices to drug traffickers. Um, and crucially, the agents had access to something called the portal. This is basically a website they could log into and they could manage devices. Okay, I have a new customer who wants to buy five new phones. I'll manage their subscription here, ship them the phones, all of that sort of thing. I think in total there was something like 150 agents, 150 people spread all around the world doing the FBI's dirty work for them, basically, and they had no idea. And then in the portal, you can do the wipe uh, feature as well. Um, something which is very crucial for these encrypted phone companies is that you can contact them, be that Phantom Secure or Sky or EncroChat, and I'll talk about those in a bit, and go, hey, the cops got my phone, please wipe it, please wipe it. And then this is where they would do it, and they would push a button. Of course, with a norm, it doesn't matter. The FBI already has the messages right, but the FBI still had to do these sorts of things so a norm looks legitimate to the drug traffickers. And then, of course, at the bottom, you have the end user. You have the drug traffickers themselves. And I've read hundreds of thousands of anon messages at this point over very months and months and months uh, of going through them. And you can see the emojis there. I think you'd be shocked at how casual some of these conversations are, where they're even talking about ordering assassinations, and they do it with like a laughing emoji. Uh, or hearts or whatever. Sometimes you have people asking for a bulk discount if they order five hits at once. Um, then you have the amphetamine in the middle, that's stamped with a Louis Vuitton logo. You then have, um, that's a ledger, a hardware Bitcoin wallet, right? I was genuinely shocked by the amount of Bitcoin mentioned in these messages. I've covered cybercrime for like 10 years, you know, ransomware actors, normal cyber criminals. Drug traffickers are making heavy use of cryptocurrency. And it's not just a couple of them. It's like, we're going to buy wholesale quantities of cocaine or methamphetamine uh, in Bitcoin, which I was genuinely taken aback by. And then that's just, you know, a nice little amphetamine lab that came across the norm. So you, you have this pyramid scheme, basically. But there's another uh, layer at the top of it. And of course, that's the FBI, who's actually secretly managing and controlling all of this. While they were pretty hands-off most of the time, as I said, they did call the shots on put that feature in, don't put that feature in. And they did sometimes intervene when stock got low. So there's one episode in the book where stock is running low of Google Pixels in Europe. Anon is buying so many phones off the refurbished market, you literally can't get a Google Pixel from some of these wholesale providers. So the FBI flies a Gulfstream jet packed with duffel bags of Google Pixels from DC over to the Netherlands. And then they leave them in a, I think the Dutch authorities leave them in a, in a dead drop, the agents come and pick them up, and now Anon has more phones, and the sellers had no idea it was the FBI that actually shipped those Google Pixels. So, and of course the money trickles up, from the end users, to the resellers, to the distributors, to AFCU, to the FBI. I don't know exactly how much this operation cost. The FBI refused to tell me that in the interviews I had with them. But my understanding is that as the money went up, the FBI sometimes reinvested it back into the business as any good business person uh, would, right? And it was really expensive, not only the hardware I mentioned, but you have to get the eSIMs, they have to be unlimited data, they have to be up all of the time, you have all of that infrastructure and networking I mentioned. If you have any downtime in an encrypted messaging app, I mean, as we all know, you know, when Signal or Freema or Telegram or whatever has an issue and we can't text our friends, it's very annoying. Imagine being a drug trafficker and your, your NOM app goes down. The FBI had to 
had to have it be very effective, very fast, and uh, very efficient. There is another structure as well. So I mentioned I spoke to the, the coders behind the device, and that's AFCO again. On one side, there's a project manager who obviously oversaw some of the app development. And then there's a small team of Android devs, some who I've spoken to, and they made the Anom app. They had no idea they were in effect working for the FBI. They found a job on Fiverr or some other freelancing website. They sign up, they get paid a thousand bucks a month, and they just ship their product like any other sort of Android developer. Then on the other side, Arcane OS. This is the custom operating system I mentioned. And AFCU, it seems through my conversations with people involved, compartmentalized these teams. One didn't really know about the other, or if they did, they didn't really communicate. And I think this is part of why this massive worldwide undercover operation did not leak. And I think it's an absolute miracle that it didn't, to be honest. Um, so story time. I mentioned Microsoft and the black boxes. So the FBI starts reading the messages in 2019, and they're, they're in San Diego and they're digging through all of them. As I said, they're finding a lot of them are not in English, so they have to get help translating them. And they start giving ad hoc intelligence to different European authorities. So in uh, the Netherlands, they learned that somebody was going to be kidnapped. Well, they send that to our legal attaché at The Hague. He'll tell the Dutch authorities there's going to be someone pulled into a van at this point and they have these weapons, that sort of thing. Um, at first, they don't really tell them the secret of how they're getting this information but it's clear the intelligence is very, very good. Uh, eventually, that FBI front-end interface I showed, the FBI gives access to that to these uh, other agencies. So this is BKA, the sort of Germany's FBI, I guess. And that letter, I'm not expecting you to read German, obviously, unless, unless you can, but the vibe is basically that BKA gets access, they're reading through the messages, and the FBI doesn't even tell them it's from a norm. It's just like, here's a bunch of intercepted messages, go do what you want. The Germans have to figure that out themselves. And the FBI does this for the Dutch and the Swedish, as I said, until eventually something like 16 countries all become involved in this massive task force at Europol to dig through the data. So, the most transformative moment for Anon is the shutdown of Sky. This was the juggernaut of the encrypted phone industry. Something like 70,000 phones around the world. Many of them uh, were serious organized um, drug traffickers. The phones were so popular, as you can see, that some traffickers even put the Sky logo on their box of drugs while they were smuggling them as sort of a shout out to their favorite phone company. There is insane brand loyalty in this underground industry. Um, eventually in 2021, the European authorities hack into Sky in sort of a separate but, separate but parallel investigation. And they get half a billion messages that were thought to be encrypted, a massive uh, intelligence haul, and then in sort of a double punch or like, like a, in complementary to that, the US DOJ also indicts the CEO of Sky. Um, Sky obviously has to shut down. You know, it just got hacked, it lost all of the messages, and now its CEO is an, an alleged uh, criminal. That's when the order from high up in a norm, and my understanding it was Hakan Ayik, gives the message to push, push, push. This is the biggest uh, opportunity in the encrypted phone industry possibly ever. The biggest company has been knocked out of the market. Now we can jump in and we can seize on this. So they just start selling as many phones as they can. They even try to expand into Russia by smuggling the phones through various other European countries. Of course, the FBI is going to love it if the phones land there as well. And then eventually, the customer support of Anom starts receiving messages in Russia. So it looks like the phones actually did uh, manage to get there. One of the people behind this uh, expansion is this Microsoft person I've been talking about. He's the one on the left uh, sat down, and then the one on the left here with the fiery face mask as well. He is, I wouldn't say a top tier drug trafficker, but probably a mid tier. If you can think of some sort of way to smuggle drugs, Microsoft has probably already thought of it, or he's probably already done it. Here is one example where 
he had a speedboat in Sweden, and he got two people to go out there, drive out into the ocean at the dead of night, meet a passing uh, massive freighter ship where corrupt workers would throw 400 kilograms of cocaine over the edge. It would then float because it had these sort of buoyancy devices in it. They would grab it and then bring it back. So, I mean, he's clearly a big deal because he's dealing in nearly half a ton of cocaine. He's also uh, talked about having airfields in Denmark to receive drugs. I've seen messages where he spoke about having a corrupt worker inside an energy drink factory and they could put the precursors to amphetamine inside the energy drinks and then ship those onwards. Um, just any sort of scheme you can think of, he has probably discussed it, as I said. Um, but then there's something of a, a power tussle inside Anon. So while the FBI is secretly managing it and the distributors below are sort of doing their thing, some of them want more control than others, especially Microsoft and especially Hakanaik. So this is the, the Anon office. This wasn't made by the FBI. This was made by Hakanaik in Istanbul, Turkey. He took it upon himself to order this Illuminous Anom sign. Uh, people who sent it to me said it was cringe. Um, that's their words, not mine. Uh, but you can see the logo and then enforce your right to privacy and then they have branding on the laptops as well. And the idea is that, well, two things. It kind of gives Anom some legitimacy. Like, look, we're the real deal. We have a really nice office in Istanbul. It's also to give Hakanayik legitimacy, because he started introducing himself as the CEO of Anom, even though that's Afku, the guy who's working for the FBI, right? And the reason for this is that drug traffickers have seen that selling phones is maybe not just as prof profitable as drug trafficking, but it's a pretty damn good business. And if you can control the supply of those phones as well, you can make a ton of money alongside your cocaine smuggling. So there's Microsoft giving a nice, Thumbs up in the Anom office. Um, that middle photo is obviously a, the Anom sticker on a, on a laptop. Um, I don't think that's specifically the Intel black boxes, but they're flashing phones basically in Istanbul. Um, and then there's Microsoft uh, tallying up some of his drug uh, winnings or much later, his drug losses because the Swedish police and other authorities keep seizing all of his drug shipments and he has no idea why. He blames other people he works with. People say it has to be the phones. There's something about these phones and he just won't hear it at all. Um, on the black boxes, the most crucial thing is that Microsoft and Hakan figured out how to clone those Intel boxes. So rather than having to wait for a surreptitious uh, shipment from the FBI, they could just make a black box and they can make as many phones as they wanted. They could be in complete control of the distribution of these devices. And that's how Anom, in my opinion, started to grow out of control. It started to grow so big, the FBI was swimming in messages. One of the agents involved said it was like trying to pilot a plane while it's trying to crash. You just have to keep going. You have to keep going. Which brings us, obviously, to this map, which is the sort of final tally of devices that were using the Anom backdoor. Um, orange is where uh, our countries that contained Anom devices. Obviously, it's the vast majority of the planet. It was, in a, it was in more than 100 different countries, including, as you'll notice, North America, the United States. And again, I'm not going to get super into the legality of it, but people working on Anom, drug prosecutors and the people at San Diego FBI, they wanted to monitor phones in the US. They got very, very close. They, read, they wrote boilerplate language to put into the wiretap orders, all of that sort of thing. And then higher ups at the DOJ basically never approved it. So although the worldwide operation was approved, the US, uh, the US one uh, was blocked, much to the annoyance of some of the, uh, the agents and, and the people involved. So what does all of this mean for the going dark debate? I don't really know, so I'm going to try and fluff through this a little bit, and I'm hoping that people who are a lot, lot smarter than me can probably figure out what happens next. But my main, my main takeaway is the FBI is going to do this again. When I snuck into a law enforcement conference where the FBI was speaking, right at the end, one of the FBI agents said they look forward to the next iteration of Operation Trojan Shield, which is what this operation was called. They, they are explicitly saying that they want to do something like this again. Well, 
If it's just targeting criminals, who really cares? You know, I'm sure people will have that sort of argument. Well, when the FBI came clean in June 2021 uh, with running a norm, they wanted to also not just arrest drug traffickers, they wanted to shatter trust in the encrypted phone industry. They wanted to move criminals away from these encrypted devices to maybe face-to-face -face meetings that they could lip-read or use cameras or whatever. I don't think that scales, but that was sort of the argument. In the wake of that admission by the FBI, some encrypted phone companies went dark. This is one from Cypher that said, you know, rather than doing this anymore, we're just gonna, uh, we're gonna shut down, basically. You still have some encrypted phone companies. There's one called No1BC, which me and some Italian colleagues we revealed is actually currently used by the Italian mafia as well. But in my conversations with drug traffickers and the people who sell these phones to them, Many people are now just buying a graphene phone, they install Signal or Freema or Wicker, I mean Wicker's dead now, but some sort of consumer app, and then they use that and then they throw the phone out. And I think that brings up a key question, especially because as I said, the FBI are not just going home, they want to do something like this again. What happens when more and more the drug traffickers are using Signal or some sort of app that human rights defenders, journalists, activists, technologists, hackers, all of us use, what happens then? Through doing all of this reporting, I've come to the conclusion that there's sort of three options. Maybe there's a fourth option I'm not aware of, but this is sort of what I see. First, there's the front door, and I think we're all familiar with this. You know, apps give data to law enforcement when there's a legal request to do so. Discord does this every single day. Gmail and Google do it. Twitter, obviously. And that's... I guess all well and good for non-encrypted services, but I don't think any of us would really want Signal or an end-to-end -end encrypted messaging service to start holding more user data so then it could be given to authorities, right? Um, Signal, when it's compelled to do so, only provides um, the, the, the date and time an account was made and the last time it was used, a very, very small amount of data, and I think everybody probably likes that, except law enforcement. Then you have the back door, which is what I've been talking about. It's about a norm. Law enforcement compromising entire chat platforms. A norm. They also did EncroChat. They did Sky as well. That has massive latitude for collateral surveillance. I found that people on a norm included lawyers who aren't suspected of a crime. Their only crime is providing legal advice to drug traffickers, which is a very basic tenant of our justice system. Whoever you are, you should be able to get legal representation. And this threatens that. The last one is targeted hacking. I'm sure as everyone in this room will know, that relies on a very expensive market of exploits and offensive tools. You know, to get on, a, on an iPhone, you're going to need Safari or, or an iMessage exploit. You're going to need something to get out of the sandbox. You're going to need a kernel as well, uh, if you want persistence. So that's all very expensive, and that's going to be very, very hard, potentially, for agencies. Through my conversations with people who sell malware to Five Eyes law enforcement and intelligence agencies, it can be crafted in a way to collect only certain information from certain devices. Now, that, it can obviously still be massively abused. We've all seen NSO Group, Hacking Team, Finn Fisher. But if you were to put a gun to my head and I had to accept one of these, it might be targeted hacking. I'm not endorsing it. I'm sure many people would disagree. It's just out of those. That seems like the, late, the least bad, but again, I'm not sure. I'm hoping others now can take this debate and sort of run with it. But my main takeaway is that the status quo is not sustainable. The status quo is what led to a norm. The FBI didn't do this in a vacuum. It did it because it felt empowered to. It felt like this was a legitimate option to do. And I don't know what happens now, apart from them trying to do something. And I just really, really hope that now this information is out there in the book and this talk, and we're going to publish an article probably when I go off stage in a minute, I guess, or in a couple of days. But people need to talk about what actually happened when there was a backdoor. Are we okay with that? Do we want them to do this again or not? So thank you so much for listening. I will be at the Crypto and Privacy Village at 4 p.m. doing a very mini version of this talk. I'll also have copies of the book you can buy for 30 bucks. Please bring cash because I don't know what else I'm going to do and please subscribe to 404media.co. I really, really appreciate your time.